So in the last class, uh, we were looking at the lateral force generation. We said that the, the key factor in the lateral force uh, generation was the distortion, which, of course, to the contact patch, which actually makes the tire assume a direction, okay, which is at an angle to the direction in which the tire is supposed to be moving. So if this is the straight running tire, and if you now, let's say that that is the uh, central part, and then if you now give a steering input, okay, which, would, which we said is delta, and then the, actually there is a slip angle produced, and so on. And we saw that the distortion causes that centripetal force that is required in order to sustain the centripetal acceleration. In other words, cancels out the D'Alembert's force called the centrifugal force. Um, the end of the class, we said that we get Fy, and then we have what is called as the restoring moment. Restoring moment is due to the centrifugal, sorry, centripetal force not act, actually acting at the center and that it acts at a distance which we called as pneumatic trail and then we had a curve which, which we plotted in the negative direction because it, okay, I, I think we plotted it together. Let me do the same thing here so that, yeah, that's what we get and that is alpha. Remember that this is Fy and remember that that is the M Z, which is the self-aligning torque, right? This is what we did. So the question towards the end of the class, why I just brought this to your notice is that uh, why is this aligning torque? No, why is this taking this shape? Okay. In other words, why is the aligning torque becoming zero when the force reaches that saturation point? Remember that the the shear forces, okay, the shear force which is responsible for that uh, Fy, okay, is something like this. Right? So, and there is a moment also, uh, sorry, there is a normal pressure which is, we will just remove this, you know what is alpha now. So, which is like that. Now, because of the fact that, assuming that uh, there is no slip, because of the fact that it is uh, now shifted to the left, in other words, there is an unsymmetric distribution, obviously the resultant force will not be symmetric, but is the resultant force because of all those shears or all those pulls of, the, of those bristles which were there, uh, they happen to be not symmetric, but it is unsymmetric. Right. Now, Imagine that slowly guys are not going to slip. When it slips, what happens? It reaches a maximum okay, value which is mu into qz. Right? So it sort of starts now pushing because all, all of them are going to assume the value of mu qz. And this is this being almost symmetric, okay. This one, yes, it is not exactly symmetric, but it's assuming that it is almost symmetric, this guy is now going to move towards the center. <coughs> so in other words, this situation, at this situation where all of them have reached that mu qz, okay, which is the maximum force that can be um, delivered by these bristles, uh, the force, resultant force position now shifts towards the center and T goes to 0. So if you assume, for example, a good parabolic distribution, okay, the mu qz also will be parabolic and hence it will be exactly symmetric and the force sitting at the center 
Okay. So, for a brush model with a parabolic uh, pressure distribution, the aligning torque goes to 0. Right? Actually, it does not go exactly to 0 because of the fact that it is not, it is not very symmetric and, and hence it may actually be something like this and so on. Okay. Now, the question we asked in the last class was that is the lateral force development only due to cornering? Is there any other means of developing a lateral force? That brings us to a very important and interesting topic which the tyre manufacturers call as Pleistier and Conicity. Ply steer, as people call it, is something like a steer like behavior, and conicity is something like a camber like behavior. Now, let us now let us look at what is ply steer. Yes, any questions? Okay. Now, let us look at what is ply steer. Let us say that that is the tire which is moving in this direction, rolling in that direction, right? What is a tyre? Let us look at this, say for example, a truck tyre, similar is what you have for a passenger car tyres and you have the tyre here, okay? Now it has what are called as belts, okay? In this case, it is steel belts, okay? and there are a number of belts. It can be three belts, four belts and so on, right? If you look at these belts closely, I will just zoom that here and draw it here. If this is one belt, if this is one belt, I already told you this, that there are steel cords which run like that, okay, which run like that and, and that there may be another, uh, there will be another belt, okay, which is where the steel cords run in different directions and so on. There is an angle to this, let us not worry about that, what is exactly the angle and so on, right. In other words, this whole of this belt bundle, the bundle which is just above what we call as the body ply, okay, behaves as a composite laminate. And what is the importance of composite laminate? It has a very interesting property. Maybe you have studied this in uh, mechanics of materials. Okay, let us do that here. So, if I have now uh, a sheet, say for example, made of steel and then pull it, we told this already in last class that it just gets pulled and that there is a Poisson's effect in the other direction. Okay. Now, let us see what happens when I pull this here in this case. Now, that is a sheet okay, that's, that consists of a number of all these uh, what we call as reinforcements, these belts. Let us say that they are all together and now I am going to pull this sheet. Okay. If it were steel, I know what you would expect. It would just go like that and this will be in one plane. There will not be out of plane out of this plane, there will not be any deformations, right? Now, let us see what happens here. Yeah, you pull it, oh wow, I did not apply any force in the other direction. I just pulled it and what happened? Whole thing twisted, okay? So, in other words, there is a coupling between this longitudinal force or one force to the other moment and so on. Right? Clear. So, this is one running in one direction. If it were to run in another direction, then it would go the other way. Okay? So, these are called as coupling stiffnesses. Okay? These, th there is in other words, a coupling happens between one plane, what happens in one plane to another plane. In order to explain this, let us put down, let us go into some details on, on the on the laminate theory, we will not go 
too much details into laminate theory, but we have to understand this. So, we will go into some details of the laminate theory. And what does this laminate theory say? Let us look at what we call as the constitutive relation for a laminate, laminate plate or laminated plate or what is called as the laminate theory, right. So, what are the forces and moments that act? See, what is the constitutive equation? I have the, in this case, forces, moment and I have some terms here, constitutive terms and this is what I would call as strains and so on, right. So, let us say that I have n x force n y n x y m x m y m x y right ok. What is this? If I have a laminate like this just give a small thickness to it. So, that the thickness is say 2 h and let us say that that is the weight direction and that is the x direction and the force that is happening here is this n x force here in this plane is sorry n y force that is happening here or force that is pulling here is n x and n x y n x y is this and n x y n y x and so on or in other words if you want to write that as uh, n y ok y um, x is the plane y is the direction. So, if you want to write it like that this becomes n y x plane direction and n x y. right ok. We know that n x y should be equal and so on. Now, what is the right hand side? The right hand side of the strains epsilon x, epsilon y, epsilon x y and then it is a laminated plate, a laminate theory. So, you will have what we call as curvatures. So, you have curvatures x, curvature y, x y. Now, these two are related by this constitutive equations. Let us say that we will divide it by 3 by 3, 3 by 3, 3 by 3, 3 by 3. So, we will call that as A, we will call that as B, call that as B and that we will call it as D. Okay. Now, let us see what A is. So, there are terms here. Let us not worry about how the terms are calculated. Any composite books will book will give you the terms how it is calculated. So, we will call that as A 1 1, A 1 2 0, B 1 1, B 1 2, B 1 x uh, sorry B 1 6 ok. So, these are these are terms which depends upon the new values E x, uh, uh, E values and so on ok. So, let us not worry what it is that is not our uh, intention. So, it it will you can go on like that b 1 2 b 2 2 and uh, a. So, this is a way of I mean the numbers are important. So, we will write this as b 2 2 6 ok and this would be a we will say a 1 2 let us let us be you know correct to a book a 2 2 0 0 0 a 6 6 b 1 6, b 2 6, b 6 6 and that b gets repeated there again ok. Same way you will have d 1 1, d 1 2 and uh, d, yeah they are values ok which are coefficients. What are they? Very similar to what you know for example, in plane stress and plane strain ok. Say for example, you have sigma is equal to E epsilon 
right? So you have a constitutive equation, so which relates stress and strain. Okay. So this, uh, what what do they depend? For example, in isotropic material, what enters into this, into this? E and nu. So you require two quantities for an isotropic material, E and nu. Okay. So here, this is not this is a laminate. And so this is not an isotropic material, okay, and hence you have, okay, a matrix which is similar to this. That's why I said let's not worry. Let's not go into the details. It's not to not to explain laminate theory, but to explain why it happens and how that causes what what is called as the Pleistier. Yes. So what is M X Y? M X Y. Okay, F good. So M X M Y and M Z. Are the result of they are the moments, okay? Sigma x, sigma that is the sigma x multiplied by z, okay? Dz minus h by two to plus h by two. Similarly, my minus h by two to plus h by two sigma y into x into uh, tz right and what is mxy sigma xy multiplied by z so mxy is oh sorry Okay, so the moments are the result of stresses that are acting in this plane. You know, remember, we had a simple beam. Remember that we had a beam bending. That's the beam, say, for example, in your earlier classes on mechanics of materials. So when the beam bends, you would have. Okay, the. How do you have this? So you have, for example bends like this okay a moment that's created and that would be the stresses that are acting okay sigma xx is a neutral axis and that these stresses cause or equilibrate the moment so that is what you get right okay it's exactly like that it's a plate what's a plate you can assume that a beam is extruded in the other direction so you have a plate and the plate is extruded in the third direction it becomes a, uh, a beam extruded in the third direction it becomes a plate okay right any hey, questions yes yes this is right this is the way you express I, I didn't say it's the same i said it's similar okay so this is the way you express for a laminate laminated plate okay so express it in terms of force Express it in terms of strains as well as curvature. Right? Okay. And those forces are, of course, related to the stress through those kind of relationships. Is NX the same as sigma X? Exactly not the same. That is exactly what I am trying to say that they are, that's the force that is that's acting. Uh, yeah. NX is the force that's acting, and why? MX, is that sigma x or uh, sigma x? Hey, when I define sigma mx, I define it as sigma x or sigma xx if you want. That to is not an x. The sigma. No, no, no. That is sigma xx. Okay. It is sigma xx into what into is that z? Right. That's what creates the moment. Okay, you have n x n y and n z, right? That's the force that's acting in the x y and the z direction. Okay. Any questions? Right. So uh, the left hand side represents the stresses and the moments acting. Hmm. The, uh, the right hand side, the extreme matrix represents the uh, deformation yeah. in the x-y. Yeah. Please note, 
N X is due to sigma X. Which means that what is N X? How, can, how do you define N X? Just integrate minus H by 2 to from the same thing. If M X is like this, N X is That's it. Clear? Okay. So, note the difference the way a plate is written and a regular constitutive equation. Can you call this as constitutive equation? Yes, you can keep debating that because constitutive equation is stress and strain for a material. Now, you are talking about plate, of course, I agree. Right? Any questions? So, this is this is the equation which you would look at. Now, what do you mean by, okay, having understood that, what do we mean by coupling? What do you mean by coupling? When I apply epsilon x or epsilon xx, right, when I apply epsilon xx, I would expect a force nxx or nx. That's all I would expect. Okay. Now there are in the same fashion x, epsilon y, and so on. Okay, but these coupling terms here give a different picture. So, for example, here I have b one two, b two two. B one six and so on. Right? What is the picture it gives? What is that you get from this? Okay, I, I give you a minute to understand that. So, what is it that that it gives? The elongation also gives moment with force. Correct. That's it. So, in other words, there is a coupling between the two in the sense that elongation also gives a moment. Okay, or shear gives a moment. Okay, mx. Is it twice or yeah, of course, because that's how it is populated, right? That's how it is populated, isn't it? Right. So, in other words, if I change a curvature, if I change a curvature term, say for example, kx term, if I change, then it is it is not that if, if I change this term, it is not that I get only a moment for changing the curvature. You would, you would imagine that I have a plate like this, you know, I change the curvature, the curvature is changed only by giving a moment. This is what usually you think. But it not only does that happen, in other words, not only is the moment, of course, moment has an effect, but you would see that there are terms which would also give rise to your force. Clear? Okay. So, in other words, that is why what happened here is that when I stretched, twisted and so on. Okay. How do I apply this? So, what is that we are talking about? Why are we talking about this? Changing curvature gives rise to a force. Fine. So, why? So, what happens? So, why is that I am worried about it? Why is that I'm worried about it? So if the tire, even though the vehicle moves in one direction, because mm -hmm. the deformation in one direction, mm -hmm. there'll be a reaction in all three directions as well as no. Suppose that's the belt. Okay. Forget about direction, forget let's uh, understand the physics. Suppose this is the belt, okay. Of course you know that it is just circumferentially going. I'm I'm looking at a cross section. Okay, that's the tire. That's the tire and that's the belt. 
So when this tire hits the ground or when it is sitting in the ground, in effect, what am I doing? I am changing the curvature, okay? I am making this guy flat. Okay? In other words, I am sort of I am giving a moment to make it flat. When I give a moment to make it flat, okay, what am I attacking? I am attacking this. I am attacking that. But when I attack that, or in other words, when I change kappa x, if I call that as kappa x, the curvature will change it, then there is one term which is sitting here, which I will multiply by kappa x in order to give n x y. Right? I change this, I give n x y term, it is a force term change this, here is one guy who is going to give me a force NY term and so on, right? So when I change kappa x, it is not just moment. So you would think that, uh, fine, I have a curvature like that, I am making it flat, how do I make it flat? Maybe give a moment like that and make it flat, right? But that is not just what happens and you have forces. So in other words, I am producing a force here. Right? And I am I'm producing a force in this direction. Sir, why are some terms of the uh, A matrix 0? Yeah, uh, that is why I said that let us not, why is that 0? Okay. The, uh, there is no coupling between those elements. Yeah. Of course, why? That because there is no material. coupling term between the shear and the longitudinal force. Okay, Poisson's effect is only x to y direction. So, gamma x y is g into, uh, sorry, uh, tau x y is equal to g into gamma x y. Okay, go back to your earlier class on mechanics of materials. All right? Okay. So, there is, in other words, obviously, there is a shear term does not have any effect on the force term. Okay. Vice versa. Right? In other words, there is no coupling. What it simply means is that I will, I would eliminate all these guys. These two guys will be done with, zero, no coupling and I will have only these two terms. These terms are your familiar terms. For a minute, for a minute forget about all this. So you would see that just force and, ah, well known, okay, A11 into epsilon x, A12 into epsilon y, zero into ga epsilon x y or gamma x y or how you call it, okay, right, that is all. So, the shear force is equal to the, or the shear stress which is the result here is nothing but this multiplied by the shear strain, right, okay. Does that clarify your doubt that there is a shear term that is involved that has nothing to do with the normal force terms, okay. Let us come back, there are a lot more to look at it. So, kappa x I am going to change now because I am going to make it flat. When I make it flat, obviously I am introducing forces, okay. I am introducing forces because of this coupling term and those forces introduce the lateral force, okay, the lateral force and a moment and a moment. So, simple fact that as the tire rolls on the ground and a part of the tire becomes flat results in a lateral force called Pleistier. Okay? So, if I have this, these are the two tires which are running and it is right. So, this produces, has a part of its uh, belt flat and hence <coughs> there will be a force that will be acting. So, why can't we cancel everything? Yes, very good. So, the question here is that does it get cancelled? It's a very important question. Can it get cancelled? See, let us say that I have this belt structure, okay. Now, I have this belt structure. In other words, 
what happens if I rotate the tire, okay, if I rotate the tire and keep it, okay. You have to be very careful and there's a lot of confusion for people in ply steer and that. Suppose I have this tire, okay, how do I cancel it if I have this force to act in the opposite direction? Can I ever make it happen like that, happen that way? Can you do that? You rotate it. You, whatever you want to do, you do. You rotate it. Okay? You rotate it, the structure will exactly be the same. Structure will exactly be the same. You rotate it like that, it will be like this. Put a point here, okay? that point will go here, this point will come here. So, it is not, you cannot cancel that. Okay? But if you, if you rotate in the opposite direction, the force will be in the other direction. Okay, you can change that, in other words, by the structure of the ply in the two directions. So, there is always a confusion that ply steer changes direction, whether you rot rotate it in clockwise or counterclockwise. True, but you do not rotate the tire, okay, you do not run the vehicle in the counterclockwise, you, you run it only in one direction. So, you call this as the right tire, for example, and the left tire. Okay. And now superimpose on, on the, say for example, I plot alpha versus both the aligning, this torque which we called, which we called as aligning torque, the torque that, that happens is due to the NXY term and a lateral force, the NX term. Okay, so that happens to be like this, and it so happens that because of the directions that you will get, if this is the uh, lateral force, not left force, lateral force, if you want to call it like that, lateral force, okay, that is the aligning torque. And these are, in other words, when they are 0, not when alpha is equal to 0. In other words, when alpha is equal to 0, okay, what is alpha? Slip angle. We said slip angle alpha is required in order to produce a lateral force. So, when it is 0, you would see that there is a lateral force and a corresponding uh, moment. Clear? Hold this for a minute. We are going to come back to this graph. We're going to explain it again. Is this clear? So when you when it's free rolling, okay, on a ground, nothing to do with the ground, you will get a lateral force. Okay. Now there is also what is called as conicity. What is conicity? Name indicates that conicity. As you had seen that there are what are called as belts, we saw that just now. Okay. So, assume for a minute that the belts are not aligned exactly at the center. In other words, suppose I say that I, I cut this tire. Let us forget this, this part of the tire. Okay, we, will, we will concentrate on only this, this part of the tire, top of the tire. Right? That is where the belts are. The belts are supposed to be nicely placed. That is the center line. The belts are nicely placed like this. Okay, they are nicely placed with symmetric about the center. Right? I inflate it, I inflate it. There is a stiffness that is given, I inflate the tire. There is a stiffness that is given to the tire because of these belts. Okay? So, it assumes a uniform, say, radius 
or in other words, it, it, uh, the, the deformations on either side is the same, right? Let's say that that's the deformation due to inflation, okay, of the belt, inflation with the presence of symmetric belts. Let's do a thought experiment. Let us say that the belts are not right uh, symmetric about the center. They are not symmetric. They are not right. They are not symmetric about the center. They are not correctly placed. So, I will have say let us say that there is a belt what we call as belt offset. So, this guy is like this. Okay. Left and the right placement of the belt are not symmetric. So, what happens, what is that you conclude looking at this left hand side and the right hand side, what is that you conclude looking at the left hand side and the right hand side? The radius in the left will be higher. Fantastic. So, radius in the left when I inflate it will be higher because this is going to be stiffer. So, this, these guys sitting here, these, these material elements are not going to move to the same extent as to the left. And hence, okay, my tire is going to become something like that. In other words, my tire is going to look like a truncated cone. Right. So now you have a truncated cone. Let's say, let me just exaggerate that. And roll a cone. Roll a cone, what happens? So, there will be a force generated. Yeah, yeah, bo bottom, yes, bottom surface will be flat, but still I am going to flat, okay, like it will be like this. There will be a conical, conical shape. In other words, the pressure distributions on either side is not going to be the same. So, with the result there is a cone, it is as if there is a cone sitting and then rolling. With any dam and uh, uh, wheel and tire interacts with the road, the surface is always flat, right? The surface, correct, agree with you, surface is flat, but the pressure distributions are not going to be the same, okay. That is exactly what happens in a cone. The cone is also when it is placed, okay, it assumes the, pla assumes the surface, you know, it becomes one, one side becomes flat. It is not that it is, it is like this, it becomes flat. So, when you rotate it, why is that it is not going straight? It goes like this, right? Yeah. Exactly the same thing, right? Okay. So, the cone you are placing it on the ground, which means that, which means that please note that one side of the cone is sitting like this. So, the cone will be sitting like this, okay? Fine. So, this is what is called as the conicity effect. That is give rise, giving rise to a force. Right. Now, this is one thing which is not, which is not necessarily is one side or the other side because it depends upon which side it is shifted. So, if you now take a number of tires, you go to a, one of the manufacturing plants tire manufacturing plants, you take hundreds, hundreds of tires. Now, and then, okay, say that I want, I measure hundreds of tires, I measure the lateral force. Let us say that that is the lateral force, let us say that is positive and that is negative and let us say that this is the number of tires. I take 1000 tires. What would happen? is that okay you will get suppose i get a peak like this a, a very pointed peak okay and say i get a peak or i get something like this okay right i have tires which are so if i get a peak like this suppose i get a peak like this in the tires, 
if I get a peak like that in the in the tires which I have tested, which this means one minute. This means that this peak peak is what all the tires whatever I have tested, okay. This is a false say. Let us say that it falls within this gap. All the tires which falls within this gap, small gap, almost the same. Then that lateral force is ply steel because ply steel is due to the design. Okay, here, if it were, if if it so happens that the tire, the force distribution is something like that, then there is, that's not ply steel. That's not ply steel. Basically, because it is distributed on either side. And so the belts are offset this side or offset the other side. Right. Okay. We'll we'll come to the effect th this diagram um, in a minute. Let's let's forget. Let's uh, let's go and look at. Are there any other things that cause a peculiar behavior of the tire? Right. So in other words. Straight running tire, is it going to be a nice guy who is going to go run straight or he is going to do other magic, other things? Is yes. Yes, it is most of the most, in most instances, it is this belt offset that is going to cause conicity. Okay, it is a defect. Right. Now, that is not the end of the story. There are other things that are happening which are peculiar and which is not covered by all your courses in mechanics of materials. Now, what are the other things that are happening? Okay, let us look at that now. Now, let us look at the contact pressure distribution okay, and the lateral forces that take place or that is present when I roll the tire. Okay. Now, you see two things there. So, that is that is the uh, lateral force uh, distribution, right. There is a lateral force distribution that is happening. What is the importance of this lateral force distribution? Okay. Now, why is this important and what is that we are going to look at? Actually, that is the previous picture is just to zoom in and show you the values at the inner ones. Okay. Now, that is in the longitudinal direction. In order to understand that, in order to understand that picture, we will come back again to the lateral force and longitudinal force. Now, let us assume that the tread is a block. Okay. Now, if you look, uh, if you look that these blocks, they are not straight, you know, squares like this. That's a plan view. This is a plan view, and so that's a, they're not nice squares like this. Okay, they are say a rhombus type of figures. Okay, all those blocks are rhombus type <coughs> of figures. Right? We will we will explain this in a minute. We will come back to that. So, in other words, they are not what is there at the top. Okay, they are more a rhombus type of figures. Right. Now, what happens when I apply? See, let us say that let, let's now model this blocks. This is a plan view. Okay. This is a, so now let us let me. Let me model this block okay, and apply a force, say a square block, apply a force in this direction. I am applying a force in this direction okay, for both these things. Right. Now, let us see what happens. Okay. So, I, I can do two things. One is that, one is that 
both of them, the bottom and the top are fixed not to move in the z direction. Okay. Okay, both of them are the guy is stuck between two two platens. This is what happens to a block when it is in the middle of the contact patch. At the edges of the contact patch, one guy is free. Okay? So I can free him. I can free him. Okay, we'll apply this load. Let's say that I have a square cross section, I apply this load. Okay, what do you expect? You expect it to move the direction or bend in the direction in which I'm applying the force F for a square block. I change this block to rhombus, you would see that there's a difference. Okay? Now that's the top view. That's the top view. See what has happened. Of course, it's out. Um, see what has happened. Let's concentrate on the left side. So the left side clearly shows that this is a finite element picture. It's just a isotropic rubber block. So it shows that when I when I apply a force F, the displacement F x. Let me call that as F x. The displacement is only in the x direction. For that rhombus, okay, which is very similar to that there in the block, in the tread block, if I apply a force f, x, that is f x, there is also a displacement. Look at that. There is a displacement in the other direction, y. You can see that at the bottom picture. Civil engineers long ago recognized this and call this as unsymmetric bending. In fact, when you take this next course on automotive structures, we are going to talk a lot about unsymmetric <coughs> bending. Okay? They realize that there is a principal um, axis directions okay, along which there is no coupling. And again, there is a coupling factor that is involved because I am not applying the force along the principal axis direction, which happens to be the symmetric axis. Okay? that you see, for example, in the first picture. So if I now have a block whose plan is like that, and if I have symmetric axes, okay, it is symmetric bending, it's a simple cantilever beam that bends. But, but of course, it's not a cantilever beam as you know or you have studied it because it is a short fat fellow, okay, hence shear deformations become very important. There are other things that are happening and a simple beam theory which you, which you have learned, a cantilever beam theory cannot be applied. Okay. That is one thing. Now, if this plan view happens to be not so symmetric, say now it is something like this and I am applying a load here in that direction, that is not a symmetric axis and hence a coupling happens in the other direction okay. and hence there is a there is a push. Okay? Now, that in other words, that results in, if I stop it, that results in a force. If I stop this, that results in a force. Okay. So, if now go back to my first picture, we will explain that in the next class again. Now, I have, I have shears that are happening. Okay? Let us say that I have, I have these kind of rhombus blocks sitting sitting like this, okay? And there are going to be even if it's when it's rolling. Remember that there are going to be lateral shear forces that are going to happen. Okay? That would be the lateral shear forces that would happen or that would act on these threads. And that lateral shear forces results in forces that are acting in that direction. Okay? And hence, would result in a torque 
which is called as the as Pratt PRAT Pleistier Residual Aligning Torque. Now, I have to be careful in this, but anyway, the shape is. You know, there will be, uh, this is a very simple method, simple thing, but there will be a, because of this, this shear forces that are act, acting, okay, as it goes straight, the shear forces that are acting, okay, remember that uh, the way the contact pressure shear distribution is there. So, because of the shear forces that are acting, there are forces, because of this coupling, there are forces perpendicular to those shear forces, okay. At the, at the ends, there are shear forces like that and this is the shoulder region where there are shear forces which are happening like this and at the end of the contact patch you have shear forces that are happening like that and because of which okay you have coupled forces which come along with these shear forces and the coupled forces which are acting perpendicular to these shear forces so if there's a shear force like this this is the that's the contact patch say that's the end of the contact patch and so the contact patch you have Okay, shear happening like this, here it's happening like this and these two they're happening like that and so there is always a perpendicular force that's happening, okay, that is, that's the result of, this is the result of this coupling. So when you have perpendicular forces that are, that are present and that results in a torque, okay, towards the center of the tire which is, this is the center of the tire, okay, in other words, you see that that's the So that's the, that's the center of the tire and so there is a moment that's acting. So this is another reason why there's an aligning torque that's happening when you're going straight. Okay, we'll come back to this and we'll continue with this and the other derivations in the next class.